All right, Lane Norton, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brett. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So you are a pro bodybuilder, power lifter, but also have your PhD in nutritional sciences. Give us a little background on that, like about not only your career as a pro bodybuilder and power lifter, but also when did you decide to go for the PhD in nutritional sciences? Well, whenever I introduce myself, I always refer to myself as a meathead who likes science or a science geek who likes lifting heavy things. So um, depending on my mood that day, depends on which one I swing towards. <laughs> but uh, I would say I've always had an interest in science. And when I was growing up, I wanted to be a marine biologist. And I got picked on a lot in school. So actually, like, way more than just like the, everybody went through, you know, getting teased or whatever. That's normal. But this was like a whole nother level, you know, in high school and middle school and elementary school, there's like tiers of status. <laughs> I would have been on that bottom rung of status. So um, I got pretty, not physically, but like emotionally abused by my peers growing up. And I remembered one summer I was like, I'm, I'm tired of doing this. I'm, I'm going to do something about it. So I started lifting weights. And, you know, I, my, the idea was I would stop getting bullied and get more attention from girls if I got bigger because I was a really skinny kid. And uh, lifting weights didn't do either of those two things, <laughs> but it did. I did fall in love with the process of lifting weights. And, you know, by the time I was getting ready to go to college, I was really in love with bodybuilding and I was reading like Flex Magazine. Like I remember I'd have like Flex Magazines in my backpack going to class. And when I was getting bored in class, I just whip out Flex Magazine, and start reading that. <laughs> and so by the time I was getting ready to go to college, I was kind of rethinking my idea of being a marine biologist, come to find out it's very hard to get a job in that. And they pay like, which, you know, money's not everything, but I would have liked to have made a good living. But I would also really like to do something I'm passionate about. I know I knew I did not want to do what everybody else was doing. And I came from a small, not a small town, but a, a modest sized town in the Midwest where it might as well have been an island because nobody left. Like you just grew up. If you went to college, you went to University of Southern Indiana. I grew up in Evansville, Indiana. You went to USI or you went to University of Evansville and that was it. Like if you got fancy, you went to University of Louisville or you went to IU or Purdue or something like that. But you didn't you didn't leave the Midwest. That was just not something that happened that often. And I just knew that if I didn't leave, I was going to end up like everybody else, just working a kind of, I don't want to say average job or insult people who do that kind of thing, but just your typical nine to five. And I didn't want that for my life. I wanted to do something different. So I decided to go to Eckerd College, and I had some really good professors who steered me down the right path. And I still remember my general chemistry professor saying, you should do biochemistry because if you still want to do marine science in grad school, it'll be there for you. But if you decide you want to do something different, biochemistry will really set you up for whatever you want to do in science. And so I did that. I changed my major to biochemistry. At the same time, the summer after my first year of college, I did my first bodybuilding show, won the teen division, won the novice division, and was completely hooked. And by the time I was a junior in college, I was really convinced that I wanted to make a living in bodybuilding or, or something to do with bodybuilding. I didn't know how I was going to do it because I, I didn't want to take steroids. I competed in the natural bodybuilding organization, so I, I didn't want to do that. You know, no hate to anybody who does. I don't have any uh, disrespect or anything like that. It was more about I just never felt called to do it. I never felt called to be Mr. Olympia, but I love bodybuilding, but I didn't, I didn't want to take that path personally. So I didn't know how I was going to make a living, but I got to my junior year and I'm like, well, I don't know what I want to do with my life. Uh, I know I'm passionate about this thing. I'm not sure how I'm going to make money from it. So how about going to more school? <laughs> I figured if I had a master's or a PhD, it'd probably help with whatever I wanted to do. So I did exactly that. I applied to different PhD programs. Uh, I interviewed at the University of Illinois and Penn State and Cornell. I got accepted and I decided on Illinois because I really vibed with my, the advisor there, Dr. Don Lehman. And as it turns out, that was probably one of the best decisions I ever made in my life was to go to University of Illinois, which is a great school, really really strong research and science-based school. 
and especially for nutrition, they're they're like top three every year. They're a really great nutrition program. And in particular, Dr. Lehman was a fantastic advisor. So he his specialty was protein metabolism, which doesn't take a, a difficult kind of stretch to see the connection between bodybuilding and, and why we want to study protein. And he was always very encouraging of that. He was never ashamed of the fact that I was a meathead. You know, he was very encouraging of that, which I didn't get that vibe with a lot of different professors. A lot of different professors almost seemed like they were ashamed if you were into lifting weights or bodybuilding, but Lehman was never that way. And so I got into that. During that time in grad school, I also won my pro card in natural bodybuilding. By the time I graduated, I did my first series of pro shows, my only series of pro shows so far, because I kind of, I guess I'm like semi-retired now, <laughs> but won my first pro show and then placed top five at all the other ones. So pretty successful run there. Then during that off season before that, the, that series, I'd gotten into powerlifting just kind of as a way to keep myself from getting bored in the off season. Because if you're doing natural bodybuilding, like you've got to take two, three year off seasons. Like you just don't build muscle that fast. That's why I see a lot of these kids out there or, or young guys who compete every year and you're really like, it's a really terrible idea because you're limiting your growth. So I took a four year off season between when I won my pro card and when I, won, when I did my first pro shows and it really helped me. But in that time, it was, I was finding it hard to stay motivated for training without having something to shoot for. So I decided to start doing some powerlifting meets and it turns out I was pretty good at it. In fact, I'm probably better at that than I was at bodybuilding. So, you know, got really into that. Won nationals twice, got a silver medal at Worlds, won the Arnold, set up, well, what was then a squat world record in the IPF, the biggest powerlifting organization in the world. I'm at 668 pounds and yeah, had a pretty good run there and gone through some injuries and kind of rehabbing those right now and trying to come back and do it all over again. And then, yeah, you got your PhD. Right. Yeah. So I, I finished my PhD in 2010, you know, and, and during that time, like around circa 2005, I had been writing articles for bodybuilding.com and people had sent me a lot. I get a lot of emails. I was probably getting 20, 30 emails a day with people with questions. And I, I loved helping people. Uh, I loved it. And I, but I realized, man, I'm spending a lot of time doing this. I've, I'm in grad school now. I've got to get some kind of, you know, compensation for my time. So I started doing online coaching and was one of the first people to kind of do that. Uh, this is in 2005. This is before Instagram, you know, before, before you could stick your ass in a camera and call yourself a coach, uh, I was doing it. <laughs> right. So um, got into that. By the time I was graduating grad school, I was making a, a full-time living from it. But I said, well, I don't see the reason to go get a normal job. Let's do this. <laughs> so I was doing online coaching full-time. And yeah, I have gone through several different iterations of my business, tried some different things. And now I still do some coaching, but it's mostly a lot of writing and content production. So we, I have two eBooks that are out now that have been successful beyond what I ever could have imagined and writing and writing another one and working on some other projects. And yeah, it's been a, it's been a good run. <laughs> it's been a good life. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. And I'd like to talk about one of those books you wrote, Fat Loss Forever. But before we get into the details of that one, I mean, I'm curious, when you started doing your, you know, your biochemistry work and your PhD work, were you surprised? Like, did, I mean, I, I read like muscle and fitness growing up too and all this, and like, there's all this advice in there and you're like, uh, is this really true? And there's like, I mean, even then there's all the bro science and it's proliferated even more today. Like, did you immediately like start seeing contradictions for stuff that you saw in the bodybuilding or powerlifting world or were some of the things like validated that these guys were doing that had no basis in science, but they got right just for, through trial and error? That's exactly why I went and did a PhD because I got tired of reading every magazine and having it say one thing and then another magazine say another thing or the same magazine say one thing one month and another thing another month or the same magazine saying one thing. And in the same episode, contradicting itself. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm going to go get more education. That's not going to hurt me. And I'm going to figure it out for myself. <laughs> so yeah, that was, you know, the quest for, I guess there's a couple things that make a good scientist. One is you're always hungry to learn the quest for knowledge. And two, you're inherently skeptical. You don't just accept things at face value. You question even the the things that we hold to be true 
And I think that's what makes a, a good scientist, somebody who just won't accept something as fact without really digging into it. But also the saying, be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brain falls out, right. which I also see a lot of, you know, that's like when you get to the, like there's skepticism and then there's whack job, conspiracy theorist nonsense that, yeah, I, which I kind of deal with on a daily basis now. <laughs> oh, I bet. Yeah, going to that point about, you know, being skeptical. I mean, one of the issues that I found with like popular uh, health writing is that they'll, they'll they'll talk about the studies the research and then they'll look at the conclusion and say yeah this study says x but then if you actually read the study you you realize well the sample size wasn't that big yep um it actually they, they weren't really you know it wasn't conclusive but the popular because you know the, these popular writers need to churn out content and get clicks they just come out like well this new study says coffee's terrible for you but then you look at the studies and well doesn't really say that. No, what, what it'll say is there's a component in coffee that when they fed it to rats in a super high dose, it caused like carcinogenic right. effects. You know, it wasn't actually coffee and it wasn't actually in humans. Yeah, that's there was a study done where they um the the headline was that farts can help reduce the risk or smelling some your partner's farts can help reduce the risk of breast cancer. That was <laughs> that was the that was the headline. No, what they did was they took short chain fatty acids, volatile fatty acids that are some of the things that you smell when when you fart, and they looked at them at giving them an isolated in a high dose to rats and saw an effect on cancer. That is not the same thing as smelling your partner's farts. That like the the level of irresponsibility by the media in reporting some of this stuff just to get a headline. I understand it to a certain level because they have to, because it's so competitive. If you don't have big headlines, I mean, it's like being on Instagram. Like I'm really proud of the fact that I've got, you know, whatever, 240,000 followers on Instagram because I'm not like, I'm not some dude that's posting pictures of a shredded six pack all the time, standing in front of a Ferrari that he doesn't own that he's leasing. And, you know, with pit bulls or whatever <laughs> and acting like I'm living some lifestyle, I'm putting out educational content, you know, there's substance, but we're not a substance based society. You know, people want that, that, that crap. So yeah, I, I think that the, it, it's, it's difficult to parse out a lot of what's out there, but just listening to somebody and I'll tell people, Hey, like, you know, don't take my word for it. Like, you know, I have my own biases. I try to be honest about them and upfront about them. But everybody's biased one way or another. Like, and that's okay. That's fine. It's the people who aren't willing to admit their biases. There's a there's a gal called um, what's her name? Nina. Nina it ends with a t, starts with a T. Her last name. But she's a she's a low carb advocate, big time low carb advocate. And all of her all of her a lot of her criticisms of the research out there are funding based, right? So she says, well, this study was funded by Big Corn or Big This or Big That. You ever want to make something sound scary, just put big in front of it, apparently. And what she doesn't ever disclose is the fact that she herself is funded by the meat industry, like which is fine. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. My research was funded by the Dairy Council and the Egg Nutrition Center Board. That's fine. I have to disclose that, right? <laughs> like, yeah. So if she's going to criticize all these other people, she needs to disclose what her biases are. So that's a big part of it. And and I think people get way too attached to ideals rather than trying to deconstruct their ego and figure out what stuff actually says. Like I'll tell people, like I'm not – if you read any of my books, I'm not selling any one particular diet. I'm not. I'm selling information, and I'm trying to put it out there kind of as it is. Well, let's talk about a topic, speaking of – lots of different competing things on Instagram is weight loss because there's so many competing ideas out there now and it's gotten worse, I think. So you you wrote a book, Fat Loss Forever. Yeah, uh, It's a new year. I think a lot of men who are listening to the show, a lot of them probably have goals to lose some weight. But I love how in the book you talk about and you make this important point that it's actually really easy to lose weight. Yep. The problem that people have, because people do it all the time. Yep. The problem people have is that they can't keep it off. So what's going? Why why is it so hard to keep weight off after you lose that 10 15 pounds? There's a multitude of reasons. There's there's physiological, there's sociological, and there's psychological reasons. Physiologically, 
if you think about what weight loss is, so you, we have this kind of, let's call it a set point of body fat that your body kind of likes to stay at. It's where you've kind of settled at during your life. And if you've been, usually it's your body defends against you getting too much body fat. Well, the reason people get obese is they can eat past that. And we kind of, I don't want to get way too far down the rabbit hole, but I guess there's, if you talk about losing weight, there's very tight regulations. What will happen is you get hungrier when you start to lose weight. You, your, your metabolic rate slows down. All these, uh, your, your le- hormones like leptin drop, your, your, you actually move less, whether you believe it or not. Um, like just like little fidgets throughout the day, but it, it can end up adding up to like several th- hundred calories less per day that you're actually expending. So all these things start working to drive you back towards energy balance, meaning you're, you're, you're not losing weight. Your calories in is equaling calories out. So it's trying to drive you back towards that to protect you because you have, if we're, if we have this kind of regulation on body weight, the set point that the body likes to be at, that means that it's trying to keep you from getting too big or losing too much weight. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So, so, and, and, you know, on the other end, if you start to overeat, you'll have your metabolic rate goes up, your hunger goes down, all these sorts of things. So, but on each end, there's two different, we always need to think about like, what is, what is the evolutionary reason for this? Right. Cause everything happens for a reason. All the systems in our body came about because of a reason you're dealing with two different threats to your survival. Because keep in mind, the goal of you, your existence in terms of evolution is for you to stay alive long enough to pass on your genetic material. That's, that's it. That's the goal. Okay. Now on one end you have starvation, right? If you don't eat enough, you can starve. Okay. On the other end, if you get too heavy, there in, there's an increased risk of predation, right? You can't, you can't escape a predator very well. Or the other one is you may not be agile enough to actually catch food, but that kind of would be self-limiting because <laughs> you would be, as you weren't able to eat, you would end up losing weight, becoming more agile, able to catch food. Well, over the last several thousand years, the risk of predation is dropped to basically zero for most of the world. Or, you know what I mean? That this just doesn't exist. Whereas the risk of starvation, we may not think about in Western society, but even up until like even a hundred years ago in, in, in the US, like, you know, famine was a real problem. So not so much anymore. So it's still a real problem. So that is still hardwired into our DNA. At least this is the hypothesis that some of these researchers, this guy that had this particular hypothesis, his name is Speakman. So your body has much more tightly regulated controls on you losing weight than it does on you gaining weight. So plus we have a very obesogenic environment. Like if you're talking about now non-processed foods, Right now, I don't want people to get really excited about this because there's nothing inherently fatting, fattening about a processed food. There's not. It's not 100 calories of a processed food is not more fattening than 100 calories of an unprocessed food per se. But processed food takes less energy to digest. So I guess you could argue that it is a little bit different. But more than that, it's just very highly palatable. Have you ever tried to eat? like 200 calories from a plain baked potato, like plain nothing on it. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's really hard. Right. Have you ever tried to eat 200 calories from a Snickers bar? Easy. You just eat a Snickers bar. You're done. Yeah, exactly. So we, we have a, what's called an obesogenic environment where we have free access to extremely hyper palatable, high calorie foods, and we don't move as much as we used to. So we can very easily eat past that set point, but it's hard to get under the set point because that's still a hard wired into our DNA. This is the body treats dieting like controlled starvation. So your metabolic rate drops, your hunger goes up. These hormonal, these hormonal signals to your brain, they really, there was an interesting study back in the 1940s. They took conscientious objectors to world war II and basically starved them for six months. And then looked at the physiological changes. 
Well, just to show you how powerful dieting is on motivation to not be dieting, there was originally 15 subjects in the study. It ended with 12 because one of them cut his thumb off in order to get out of the study. You can believe that. And then the other two literally stormed and assaulted the kitchen for food. And of the people who completed the study, half of them went on to work in the food industry or become professional chefs. Wow. So, um, but if you've ever dieted, like some people, like they diet and they end up watching the food, food network all the time, it becomes an all encompassing like thing for your brain. So, but the real, the major problem is that people look at dieting and weight loss as something with a set start and end date. They go, well, I'm, I'm doing, I want to lose 20 pounds. So what do they do? They lose the 20 pounds and then they go right back to doing the same that they were doing before they lost the 20 pounds. Well, what do you think is going to happen when you do that? Whatever behaviors you had to incorporate in order to lose the weight, you will need to incorporate those same behaviors to keep the weight off. That's why I say we don't really have a knowledge problem because any diet will work. I mean, low carb, low fat, intermittent fasting, whatever, anything that allows you to create a calorie deficit will work. This, we shouldn't even be spending time arguing about this. It's stupid. Like, Maybe like higher protein diets tend to work a little bit better because they're more satiating and you spare lean body mass and they they have a, a little bit more of uh, energy expenditure. That's great. But if somebody can't stick to a high protein diet or they can't see themselves doing that for the rest of their life, then it's not going to work for them, right? Any diet can work, even like a super high carb, super low fat, low protein, as long as they're in a calorie deficit will work for weight loss. It's been shown in many studies. And before, I know some of the listeners are probably saying, well, what about insulin sensitivity? 95 to 99% of the health benefits of, of dieting are strictly due to weight loss and have nothing to do with the type of diet you're on. That, that was done, there was two meta-analyses done on this. And they looked at equating calories and looking at different ratios of carbohydrates and fats and their effects on blood markers of health and found that basically weight loss explained 95 to 99% of it. So if that's the case, if it's weight loss that makes the biggest difference for health, then the best diet is probably the one you can stick to and see yourself doing for life. Because I'm going to go on keto. That's great, bro. If you're never going to eat carbs again in your life, then that can work for you. But if you can't see yourself doing that six months or 12 months from now, you got to rethink your plan because it's going to fail. It's it's behaviors that make the difference. It's the same reason like the, that people are broke. It's the exact same reason people are broke. H- how do you not be broke? Earn more money than you spend. And there are people who make $30,000 a year who can sp- who can save money. It's happened. I've done it. <laughs> I've made $30,000 a year before and saved money. It's hard. <laughs> it sucks, but it can be done. There's also people who make a million dollars a year and don't save money, right? So is it a knowledge problem? Because hopefully everyone knows that in order to save money, you need to make more than you spend. And we have that knowledge. That knowledge is there. But what do people get caught up in instead of focusing on uh, the things that actually um, help with wealth accrual? People focus on, oh, uh, they get into this pyramid schemes and they, they, oh, this one neat trick. It's the same you see in the fitness industry for fat loss. You know, oh, these three neat tricks to burn belly fat. No, that's crap. Like if you want to lose fat and you want to keep it off, it's going to be really, really hard because only 5% of people are able to do it. That's the statistics. Right. Yeah. Like 95% of people, yeah, only 5% are able to keep it off. So let's kind of recap what you said. There's a lot to unpack there and I want to go some, some different directions with some of the stuff you were talking about. So the reason why body fat is hard to lose because your body is basically saying, I'm, we're now in starvation mode, fat, we're losing body fat, but it's like, I don't want to lose that body fat because we need that for to, to keep ourselves going in case the starvation goes even further. So it just yeah, gets harder. That's and your harder. body's, you got to always think about your body fat, your body's uh, adipose stores as your energy reserve. Cause that's exactly what it is. Right. So your body's like, no, leave this alone. This is ours. 
you're taking that away. We're not going to let you do that. But also besides, you know, when you stop the diet, you gain the weight back, but also there's a tendency to gain more body fat or more weight than you were before you started the diet. Yeah, that's a phenomenon called body fat overshooting. And it really happens a lot in people who do what we call weight cycle or yo-yo diet. And um, really interesting study. We included this in the book. It, it was in rats. So some people will get their their hands up in the air. But rats actually pretty metabolically similar to a human. Now, and there is some human data to support this as well. But what they did was they took them through two different diet cycles. So they had them diet down to a – they had them – kind of eat up to a certain weight and then they dieted them down and they observed what rate it took for them to reach that weight to sort of diet down to that weight then they had them relapse to the previous weight they just gave them food and let them say hey go go for it go crazy eat whatever you want right they regained the weight in half the time that it took for them to take it off then once they reached their their previous high weight they had them diet back down again to the weight that they achieved previously, right? They lost weight twice as slow the second time, right? right. And that's with the, at the same calorie level, right? That's pretty nuts. Then they regained it. When they, they let them regain it again, they regained it three times as fast. Wow. Every time they went through one of these diet cycles, their metabolism got slower and they got more efficient at putting on body fat. And every time you diet – you activate your body's self-defense system, okay? And I, again, this is one of the things I talk about in the book. Your body has a self-defense system in place to keep you from starving yourself. And basically what it does is I, I, I kind of – this isn't in the scientific literature. This is just kind of my description. I call it a three-prong attack. You have a metabolic adaptation, which when you start dieting or, or when you're dieting, your body slows your metabolic rate. It, by, by the way, slows it disproportionately more – than you would predict by the amount of weight you lose. Because if you lose weight, you have less metabolically active tissue, you know, you, your, your metabolism is going to slow down some anyway. But you your metabolism slows about 15 to 20% more than you would predict from just from the weight loss. Then while you're dieting, your body is already ramping up systems that will increase your ability to store body fat. Okay. Why would it do that? Well, let's think about from an evolutionary perspective, if you had gone through a long famine and then all of a sudden, boom, you find a, I mean, let's just do the stereotype. You find a big old woolly mammoth and it's dead and you can eat it, right? And you can just kind of gorge yourself. Well, you couldn't really keep meat for very long back in the day, right? And you couldn't keep a lot of foods for very long. So they're going to get as much out of it as they can. Well, you would not want to be wasteful with that energy. You would want to capture as much of it as possible. You'd want to be very efficient at storing that energy and not wasting it. So that's why the body's going to ramp up those systems that help you store fat. Because if you're in a deficit, if you're in an energy, energy, if there's a body senses an energy gap, it is going to make it easier for you to store fat. Because if you come across a food stores, your body's going to want to be able to capture it. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. So. And then the third phase is they've actually observed in people who, who diet or people who diet pretty aggressively, if they then regain the weight really, really quickly, there actually is some evidence that they may actually be able to manufacture new fat cells. So we usually, if you, if you diet or you lose, if you lose or gain weight, usually what happens is your fat cells just shrink or expand. Okay. But there, you can eat past that. There is a maximum threshold for your adipocytes. It's about a hundred micrometers, I think. And so once they get across that bigger than that, we can have what's called pre-adipocyte differentiation. And these pre-adipocytes are like these little tiny nascent inactive potential fat cells that are in the adipose tissue that can differentiate to fully formed fat cells if your body needs them. So that's how people can get really, you know, like really obese because they can start triggering the, this fat cell differentiation. But there seems to be, even if you don't approach that, that maximum size, if you've been in a deficit and then you, you just kind of start massively overeating after that, like put on a lot of weight really quickly, you're, 
they've actually sh- they actually showed in rats that they could increase their their fat cell number by fifty percent, which is a real problem because now your set point's going to change because since you have more fat cells, the size of each individual cell is now smaller. So it would still, your th- theoretically, your body would still sense a deficit even if you'd gotten back up to your original body fat. And that's why I think a lot of people, when they weight cycle, they end up at a higher body fat and then have trouble losing body fat from that level of body fat because that's now their set point because they have more fat cells. That's my theory anyway. And yeah, it's pretty scary actually. If you read my, if you read Fat Loss Forever, the chapters one and chapters three will scare the crap out of you. No, oh, yeah, they, they did. So it makes it sound like, man, losing weight is impossible, but it's not. It's not. And we'll talk yeah. about what you can do to make it sustainable. But you know, you, you mentioned a lot of the the sort of diets that are really popular with people, particularly online. There's the low carb diet, keto. There's now the carnivore diet that I'm seeing a lot about. Yeah. And what's what's interesting? All these these different diets. They all claim that there's something special about these specific diets that allow people to lose weight, right? By not eating carbs, you reduce the amount of insulin pumping through your system. So like, you know, insulin can't shuttle glucose into fat cells or whatever. But I mean, it sounds like you're saying like, no, it's not really that. It's just that these diets allow you to eat fewer calories and that's why you lose weight. Is that what's going on? That's exactly right. So for example, let's take the carnivore diet, for example. It's really hard to overeat on meat, (laughs) Like it's really hard to overeat. You can do it. You can do it, especially if you're eating really fatty meat. But for the most part, meat's tough to overeat on. If you look at something like, you know, I was talking about this the other day. Everybody's got something that kind of, I call it tripping their algorithm, right? So people like with keto, I'll hear this a lot. People say, man, I tried everything out there and keto, I just, I wasn't hungry on it. And it's just easy for me. Or they'll say that about intermittent fasting. For me, it was flexible dieting you know, like flexible dieting where I'm just, I have my protein, carbon, fat targets and I hit those, but I can eat whatever I want to hit those. That tripped my algorithm because that, that felt not restrictive to me. I didn't mind for some people, they hate tracking for me. It doesn't bother me at all. If I know I can have what I want, if I track, but all these can work. I mean, like, for example, just a great example I was talking about was there was a professor at the university of Kansas state named Dr. Mark Haub. I actually interviewed him a while back when I had a podcast and he did as an effort to to prove that calories matter <laughs> and matter more than anything, he did what was called the Twinkie diet. So he literally ate all junk food. Now he only ate 1800 calories a day, but it was all from junk food. And, but he also took uh, a protein shake and a fiber supplement just to make sure he was getting all that stuff. And he lost like 30 pounds. And now what's funny is people say, well, yeah, well, what about his health though? Uh, actually they, they, he kept track of all his blood markers and every single blood marker improved like drastically. That's because when fat cells expand, they secrete all kinds of hormones that can disrupt metabolism and decrease insulin sensitivity. When you lose weight, fat cells shrink, they become extremely insulin sensitive and they stop secreting or they, they reduce their secretion of these hormones. So, and they increase secretion of things like adiponectin, which increases insulin sensitivity. So yeah, just losing the weight is the biggest part of it. Now I'm not suggesting that somebody, now if you talk to Mark, he said he actually didn't really care for the diet because even though it was junk food, like 1800 calories of junk food doesn't go very far. You know, that's like seven Snickers bars. <laughs> you could over you could eat seven Snickers bars pretty easily throughout the course of a day and not feel that satisfied. So yeah, he didn't like it because he, he was like, you know, I'd rather had a big salad or something like that. So I could have felt, you know, fuller. So I think the point is that, you know, anything can work. Keto can work. Intermittent fasting can work. Any diet can work. You can, you can look at any diet and they can find testimonials of people who have lost weight. So therefore, any diet can work if it creates a caloric deficit. The question then is, which diets lend themselves to being sustainable so that people can continue them and continue to keep the weight off? You know, for some people, keto works for them and they feel satisfied. They do not feel uh, like they need to go out and, and, and eat junk food or anything like that. It works for them. It doesn't work for everybody. I know people who put on 30 pounds during keto because they overate butter and bacon. You know, so I think if somebody, you know, 
I, I did a debate on Mark Bell's podcast with Sean Baker, who's the biggest proponent of the carnivore diet. And, um, you know, I said, I don't think the carnivore diet is the healthiest thing you can do. I mean, you know, saturated fat isn't the great evil we thought it was, but it certainly doesn't have a protective effect on heart disease like polyunsaturated fat does. And you're also like, if you're only eating meat, you, you're, you're like, you're not eating fiber, which is a big problem. And actually Sean admitted that you probably should be eating vegetables. He just doesn't. <laughs> but, um, I did say, Hey, you know, if somebody told me, if somebody was obese and they told me this is the only diet that works for me, like everything else, I feel like I, I just can't stick to it. But this meat only diet I can stick to. Chris Bell says that Mark Bell's brother, Chris Bell says that he's lost like, I want to say like 40 pounds on the carnivore diet and his blood markers have improved because he's lost weight. So if somebody says, Hey, this is the only thing I can do and keep the weight off, then that's probably the best diet for you to be honest. So yeah, I think we need to start, stop looking at like this debate over which diet is best because it's going to be for the individual. And you said you, you've read the book. So you know that I don't advocate for any one diet. I spend a whole chapter debunking claims from fad diets, but I don't suggest any one diet. I just kind of say, Hey, here's different diets. People will try I mean, you should try some, but here's, here are the series of behaviors you're going to have to have in order to lose weight and keep it off. And those are, Self-monitoring, cognitive restraint, exercise. Exercise is a huge one. People, people who generally people who lose weight and keep it off, they exercise. If you're not exercising, most the vast majority of people don't keep that weight off. And also they don't snack. Like they really don't snack very much. And they usually weigh themselves daily and they form they do some form of cognitive restraint. For example, whether it's calorie tracking, macro tracking. They're not eating carbs, time-restricted eating. You're going to have to do some sort of restriction if you want to lose weight and keep it off. Like there's going to be a restriction on your lifestyle, but you can pick the restriction you want. So for me, the restriction on my lifestyle is I have to track my intake, but I'm not restricted from any foods I want to eat because I just, I practice flexible dieting. If you don't want to track your food intake, well, maybe you could do something like keto and maybe that will work for you or time restricted eating intermittent fasting or carnivore whatever you want to call it for me flexible dieting works best but i'm not arrogant enough to think that it's going to work best for everybody so i think we really need to focus on giving people choices and focus on behaviors rather than bickering over which diet is better than another diet right we like we like to feel righteous so I think that's oh, why that's that's why rel- people who get into nutrition now are like they would have been religious zealots right it's just ridiculous how entrenched people get in their beliefs like i have the thing about being a scientist and like publishing literature is you have had yourself absolutely crushed your ideas crushed your theories crushed so many times that if you're doing it right you just don't get that married to any one idea. You don't because you know that you could be wrong. Like I'd like to think I get it right more than I get it wrong. But that's why I'm not selling any one particular diet in the book because I, I can't very well say, well, hey, the, the keto diet doesn't work when there's thousands of people who are losing weight on keto. So how can I say that? Right. So I, I think that that people, they just want to feel like what they're doing is better than everybody else. Yeah. And, you know, this is with vegans, keto warriors, carnivore, you know, if it works for you, fine. Just don't tell me it's magic. That's the only thing I tell people. I'll, you know, I, I actually uh, posted a study a while back that basically um, showed that low carb diets did not cause more fat loss than high carb, low fat diets when calories and protein were equated. And uh, I had an interesting response on Twitter. So I posted that. And somebody said, well, that's not true. I lost 50 pounds on a ketogenic diet. Uh, so this is a, an example of what I say and what a zealot hears are two different things. So I said it was not better. What that person heard was he's insulting my religion and said, I lost 50 pounds on this. And I said, well, I'm sure you did. It's just not magic. Right. Yeah. We, we published an article like, uh, do carbs make you fat? And we highlighted that research. It's basically just, it's calories. It's not the carbs. 
It's calories, mate. And yeah, the same same response. People are like, well, I lost weight on keto. I'm saying, yeah, you could lose weight on that. I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying there's nothing special about it except you're eating fewer calories. Well, here's another interesting. So, okay, losing weight uh, to be sustainable, pick whatever thing works for you in the long run. You're going to have to exercise some sort of uh, constraint. You need to exercise, actually physical exercise, because that will increase lean muscle mass, which also helps increase your metabolism. Well, actually, you know what? The 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 research on that is really underwhelming. Okay. Uh, for for like the, the amount of increase, because muscle mass is actually way less metabolically active than things like liver or intestine, like those lean muscles. So the question is, why would we exercise, right? Because lean body mass doesn't, it, the exercise itself seems to actually be, the interesting thing about it, your body is so good at self-regulating. So if you exercise more, what tends to happen is your body, you just move less throughout the rest of the day. Right. Like right. you don't realize it, but your body just actually, like you do less fidgeting and you move less. So your body's conserving energy because it knows you're exercising, right? So you're not getting as big of a calorie burn as you might think. And then – like if actually just an example of that, when I was prepping for my, my pro shows and bodybuilding, you can, like I had, I had a DVD out at the time. I, I, I've watched it years later. I talk slower and I even blink slower. I'm not kidding you. Like, and I talk way less. I'm a very talkative person. I'm a very extroverted person, but like I was just like my whole personality changed when I dieted because my body was so hell bent on conserving energy. So so why exercise then? Why is it so associated with, with keeping weight off? Because it doesn't really add to your total daily calorie burn. The lean muscle you add, sure, you burn a few more calories, but it's not super significant. The biggest reason that exercise helps is one, it, well, two reasons, I think. The major one is that it sensitizes you to satiety signals, Okay. They did a study in the 1950s looking at Bengali workers, and they looked at sedentary people, people with a lightly active job, a moderately active job, and a heavy labor job. And what they found was from the lightly active to heavily active jobs, people pretty much matched their, matched their intake So without even trying. They just ate more calories, right? And they remained in calorie balance. What they found was the sedentary people actually ate more than every other group except for the heavy labor jobs. So when you don't exercise, you have much lower sensitivity to the satiety signals in your brain. So you're, it's easy for you to overeat. Whereas when you exercise, you get more sensitive to those satiety signals. Pretty cool stuff. That is really interesting. That's very, very interesting. And then the other thing is uh, exercise increases uh, oxidation, fat oxidation in fat cells. It increases fat, fat metabolism turnover which seems to have a benefit for limiting fat regain. Gotcha. Okay, so that, that all makes sense. But here's another thing you, you talk about in the book, and I think a lot of people have problems with, is whenever they do decide to start losing weight, they'll lose weight really fast. Yep. That's probably not a good thing to do, correct? Well, so the, this is where I got I to gotta give the whole story. The research shows that people who lose more weight initially tend to keep more tend to tend to be the ones to keep it off. However, it has to be with the caveat that so so they found that of people who maintain weight loss, they usually lost a good amount of weight at the beginning. That's I think losing a good amount of weight at the beginning is okay because it, it helps you with motivation. But what you're not seeing, that statistic's a little bit deceiving because they're not asking the 95% who failed, right? Like how much did they lose initially? So there'd be a lot of people in that in that sample size of the 95% who failed to keep it off who also lost weight really quickly at the beginning and didn't sustain it. So I think it's okay to lose some weight quickly at the beginning so long as it's something that is still sustainable for you. But if you're doing something like 800 calories a day, you know, how long can you keep that up for? Not probably not very long. Now I will say there was a case study of a guy who did not eat for a year. Did you hear about this? I have not heard about this. Yeah. So he was very obese. He didn't eat for a year and he lost, I think it was like something like 150 pounds in a year. But obviously like that, that can't keep going. Uh, and I would like to see where he's at today because the metabolic adaptation to that would have been enormous. But it also goes to show that that, you know, fat is your body's energy reserve. So, you know, I, I think that. Whenever you're looking at any plan, 
it's okay to lose weight quickly at the onset as long as whatever you're doing at the onset, you can see yourself continuing to do. Gotcha. And then like, I mean, as you lose weight, I imagine you have to make adjustments. Like so if you want to lose more weight, do you have to like reduce calories more? For example, say like you, you lose, you know, the 50 pounds, right? And then like what you've been eating, say it's like 20, 2000 calories a day, whatever. I'm not saying, right. on. Like, is that, is that, a, say you're doing that at a point you stop losing weight, are you gonna have to drop calories a bit more to keep, to, to keep the weight loss going? Right. So your, your stalls are inevitable during weight loss. Anybody who's lost weight for a long period of time, I'm assuming you've probably done this before where you went on a diet and after whatever, four, six, eight, ten weeks, you stopped losing yeah. weight, right? Yeah, right. So that is your body's metabolic rate slowing down to the point where eventually it matches your intake, right? So that's the, that's your, that's the first prong of the body's self-defense system. So what has happened is you have come back to energy balance. So this is also why people get confused about a calorie deficit. They'll say, well, I was eating in a calorie deficit. I didn't lose weight. Well, no, you were eating in what might be predicted to be a calorie deficit, or maybe it was a calorie deficit for a little while, but it isn't now. See, people get confused because they think calories in and calories out are like two independent variables, but they aren't. They're tied together because calories in affects calories out. So what has to happen is when you hit one of these plateaus, you either – you need to recreate that deficit, whether it's with consuming less calories, increasing your activity, or a little bit of both. Gotcha. So this is going to, it's, it's a process. And you also talk about it, you know, one, one option too, is if you're trying to lose a lot of weight, like take breaks every now and then just for the psychological yes. rest. So you say you lose 20 pounds. All right. Well, just kind of maintenance that for a month and then go at it again. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the grind of long periods of dieting can just like wear you down. So like giving yourself like saying, okay, I'm going to lose 20. Like, let's say somebody had a hundred pounds to lose saying I'm going to lose 20 and then I'm going to give myself a month where I'm just eating at maintenance and just trying to maintain that weight loss. And that can be helpful for two reasons. One, it's a mental break. And two, whenever you go on that maintenance phase, it will help you maintain your metabolic rate a little bit better. So there's actually research on diet breaks that shows that if you use a diet break where you're eating at maintenance for a period of like a week or two, it can actually prevent metabolic slowing a little bit better than if you're just straight dieting. So you, you, there's a double effect. You get uh, the benefit of you can maintain your metabolic rate a little bit better and you have a mental break from the diet. So I think that's actually a really good way to construct things for people who are trying uh, trying to lose lots of weight or even with my regular clients, I'll do like a lot of times I'll do two weeks dieting and then one week break or three weeks dieting, one week break or three weeks dieting, two week break, you know, that, those sorts of things or four weeks dieting, two week break. So I'll use different iterations of that in order to kind of help keep things going. Right. It's like a deload week with barbell training. Yeah, kind of. Right, yeah, kind exactly. Of like let's say you want to, you know, you want to get into running, but you're also trying to lose weight. Or let's say you want to get into barbell, you know, powerlifting or whatever. Is like increasing performance in those, you know, athletic domains and losing weight, are those like diametrically opposed goals? Like do you should go for one or the other, or can you do both at the same time? You can do both at the same time. I, th I think the thing to keep in mind, especially like running, because you're as you get lower weight, you're going to be more efficient. I think the thing to keep in mind is that if you're if you're doing something like powerlifting or, or bodybuilding or, or something like that, you're not going to build as much muscle and strength as you would as if you weren't restricted. But that doesn't mean you can't get stronger, and that doesn't mean you can't build muscle. You absolutely can, especially if you're somebody who has a lot of body fat. You can still build muscle when you're when you're dieting because you have that. Even though you're in a calorie deficit, you have so much adipose tissue that your body can kind of use that as a cushion to spare protein for building muscle. But as you get leaner and leaner, it'll become more and more difficult to do that. But no, I don't think they're necessarily diametrically opposed. I just think you have to be honest that, okay, if I'm going to diet and I want to lose weight, I'm probably not going to get as strong as I possibly could as if I was not dieting. But keep in mind, in powerlifting, you might actually get relatively stronger for your body weight because we do have body weight correctional scores, right? So even though you may you may not get as strong as you possibly could have, absolutely, 
your relative strength may actually be higher. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Like that's like the Wilkes score. Or whatever, exactly. Right? Well, they actually just recently changed it to something else. But yes, it was your Wilkes score for about fifty years. <laughs> right. Well, Lane, this has been a great conversation. Is there some place people can go to learn more about your work? Yeah, biolane.com is my website. All my stuff's on there. You can. There's we got a bunch of free articles. We also have a member site. I, I think you said that you were on the site. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a member of the site. Awesome. So. We have content, but I think a lot of people, they use it for the workout builder, which is basically we have about 30 plus training templates on there for anyone from beginner to advanced for people who want to build muscle, get stronger. Or, and we, we also have female specific routines, although that's probably not my demographic on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and that's for you can you can get access to that workout builder for uh, twelve ninety nine a month. And I always say, well, you know, that's about what you'd pay for the price of a, a cup of coffee uh, at a Starbucks every week if you just went once a week. So I think it's a pretty good deal to get, you know, customizable programming for that. And then if you guys want to check out my ebooks, you can go to the biolanestore.com and click on the accessories tab or the direct links to each ebook. I have the complete contest prep guide, which is, you know, if you're interested in doing a bodybuilding show, it'll show you everything to do from point A to point Z. And that you can get that at contestprepbook.com and then fat loss forever, which we've been kind of discussing. I mean, really a fat loss manifesto. It's almost 400 pages and basically will show you everything from, from how to lose weight, how to keep it off. What are the behaviors you're going to need? What about the diet after the diet? I mean, we really spent a lot of time on it. We've already sold like 5,000 copies in just a few weeks and people are raving about it. And if you want to get that, the direct link is howtolosefatforever.com and check those out. And then I'm on social media as BioLane on pretty much every platform. Fantastic. Well, Lane Norton, thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Brett. Appreciate the time, man. My guest today was Lane Norton. He's the author of the book, Fat Loss Forever. You can find it at his website, biolane.com. Also check out our website, aom.is slash biolane, where you find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.